um, as we're doing an expedited journey through the semester, um, just want to remind everyone, of course, that everything moves pretty quick. So we've got two lectures on the urinary system, then an exam, two lectures on the endocrine system, and then an exam. So, um, but I think we're streamlining it pretty well, getting all the information out there, answering any questions you guys have about it. Um, and again, if you still have any questions or concerns, um, feel free to, to email me or ask me. Um, I've been trying to get answer everyone's questions um, as, as good as I can, as quickly as I can. So hopefully that'll, we'll, we'll continue with that. Um, all right, let's go ahead and start off. I'm gonna show you a video. This is the video that I sent out to you yesterday. Um, and hopefully you guys have had a chance to look through it. Um, if, you, if you haven't, I'm gonna show it again. If you have, it'll be a chance to uh, review it. So, and then we'll kind of proceed through the lecture, at least the first half. Okay. So the way to find it um, is you actually go onto the, our Canvas page and you can actually see, I'm kind of scrolling through quickly, way down towards the bottom. There's kind of a series of, of videos. There's one where it says renal system. I don't have videos on every system, but here's one on the renal or the urinary system. So it's like a five minute video and I'm just gonna go ahead and start that now. Dr. Crown, there's no sound on. Oh, there is. Didn't. Okay, hold on. Oh, shoot. There's no sound. Okay, hold on. Okay, let me pause it. Um, why is there no sound? That's bizarre. At least for me, there wasn't. I don't know about anybody else. Okay, let me ask around here. Let me just. Yeah, there's back. no sound. There's no sound. I, there's we could no hear you, but not the video. Huh. Okay, so I just increased the volume. Let me try, let me try again. And if that doesn't work, um, you guys can just kind of do it on your own, but let me just go back. Let's see, stop share, share screen, um, share, close caption, and let's try it. Do you hear it? It's really low. The sound is really, really low. Really low. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just, we won't do it then. I don't know why. Okay. Well, that's too bad. Okay. Well, anyway, let me um, go back. So I'm not sure why the volume is low. I've got mine all cranked up as high as possible. So um, you guys, hopefully you can, you can find it on Canvas. I definitely would recommend, um, highly recommend you guys look through it. Um, now on the exam, there's not going to be any questions from the video that aren't on the actual exam. I mean, I'm not going to do that, but the, the, the video actually will help out, help reinforce certain things. So it's like a five minute video, it's very good. Hopefully you can hear it when you're looking at it in a regular way as opposed to through Zoom. I'm not sure why that's not working. So, um, so what we'll do now is go ahead and start with the actual lecture. As long as you guys can hear me, that's, that's, that's great. Okay, all right. All right, so the urinary system. So we've covered a lot of systems this semester, right? From the beginning, um, we were looking at, we looked at the muscular system, the nervous system, digestive, cardiovascular, respiratory. Um, 
I would say the urinary system more than any other uh, is probably one of the most complex. I don't mean to scare you guys, um, but it's very complex in the sense that it does encompass really uh, the other systems as well. What I mean by that is the way the urinary system functions, it, it involves a lot of interaction with the digestive system, with the cardiovascular system. So there's a lot of um, interrelationships. Having said that, a lot of the information you already know, because we've covered digestive, we've covered cardiovascular. Um, I think it's probably one of the most fascinating systems in the sense that um, the kidneys themselves or the urinary systems are affected by so many different types of illnesses that affect other parts of the body. For example, people who have cardiovascular disease will often have urinary, or urinary problems. People who have diabetes will often have urinary problems. So it's a really, it's a targeted system that um, is really vulnerable to disease. Um, having said that, it's also still a very, very important system and we rely on it for our health and well-being. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, some anatomy. Um, the organs of the urinary system include four different ones. We start off with the kidney, which is the organ that's responsible for producing urine. Um, this is probably, of all these different organs, this is the one we're going to spend most of our time on because this is really the factory. This is the organ in which um, materials come from the blood, they're processed, regulated, and then eventually the urine is formed by traveling through the ureter. It's a tube that carries the urine that's been formed in the kidney down to the bladder. What, kind of like, in a sense, some sense, kind of like the esophagus. If you think of the esophagus as really a conduit from the oral cavity to the stomach, this is a conduit from the kidneys to the bladder. And much like the stomach, in this case, there's storage that takes place. The urine is stored prior to urination. And then urination, the urine actually passes through the urethra. So those are the four different organs. The main focus, like I mentioned, is really going to be on the kidney because that's where, that's where all the action is. So what does the kidney do? All right, so I already mentioned that the kidney isn't involved in the production of urine. Well, during the process of forming urine, if you can imagine, blood travels into the kidney and a lot of the material that goes into the kidney is excreted, but some of the material is not excreted, it goes back into the blood. <clears throat> well, while, the, while this material passes into the kidney, the kidney helps to regulate the fluid volume of the blood, blood pressure, osmolarity, and pH, right? These are all terms you've heard of before. Um, for example, if you think of, you know, if you've drank a lot of water, excessive amount of water, right? The regulation of osmolarity allows us to pee a lot because otherwise our blood will get too diluted, right? If we haven't drank very much, then our body's dehydrated, right? In order to prevent the osmolarity in the blood from going up because it's more concentrated, we tend to not only ex not excrete as much urine, but to retain water and to become very thirsty as well as regulation of pH. So we're going to take a look at all these different factors um, in terms of what goes on in the kidney. At the end of this, at the end of the regulation of the volume, the osmolarity, which involves right, all the different particles in the blood, and the pH, at the end of that, whatever is considered to be waste is eliminated, whether it's excess of water, metabolic waste, you know, byproducts of foods, as well as toxins. So whereas we often think of the urinary system as an excretory system, that's kind of a misnomer because yes, excretion does occur, but there's also processing of contents in the blood, in many cases, reabsorbing of essential materials such as ions, glucose, things like that. So it's more of a regulatory organ than just an excretory organ. 
and of course the kidneys involved in the production of hormones. Um, one, of you've, one of which you've heard of before is erythropoietin. Um, if you remember, erythropoietin is involved in stimulating red blood cell production. All right, so what do we know about the kidney as far as the, the anatomy of the kidney or really the microscopic anatomy, right? So within the kidneys, hold on, back, let me back up for a second. Uh, all right, so within each kidney, we have structures that look just like this. Take a look at this. Um, we have millions and millions of these individual structures and they're called nephrons, N-E-P-H-R-O-N. Within each nephron, like I said, there's millions of these. We have a couple different parts. We have a region of this nephron, that's this area right here, which is known as the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle consists of a capillary bed known as the glomerulus, and a surrounding structure, kind of like a cap, that's called the glomerular capsule. So one way to think about it, if, if let me just back out of this for a second, if you were to kind of think of the glomerulus as a fist, this is the capsule that kind of surrounds that fist. That's really what it looks like. All right. So that's the corpuscle, this area. Now, of course, you can see there's a lot of what we call tubular structures that go throughout the kidney. These are known as renal tubules. Before I get too far, let me just kind of give you a little overview about what's going on here before we actually get into the details. So as I mentioned before, we have these, many of these renal corpuscles and renal tubules that comprise to make a nephron. So this is one nephron. We have millions of these. When blood enters into the kidney, it goes into the glomerulus where it's filtered. Once it filters, then it passes through these tubules. And ultimately, after passing through the tubules where the contents of the blood are regulated, what's left is excreted. Okay, and we'll get into a lot of those specifics, but let me just kind of start from the beginning. So once blood is filtered here, th and think of it like cheesecloth, right? Blood enters here and it's squeezed across this capillary into this tubule, which is called the proximal convoluted tubule. And you can see the why it's called convoluted, because it actually has a convoluted shape. As the fluid, and I should mention, it's really the plasma of the blood. The plasma filters through, goes through the tubule, down through this hairpin structure called the loop of Henle. There's two parts. There's what's called the um, ascent, descending limb and the ascending limb. It's going in this direction. Once it passes through the loop of Henle, it enters into what's called the distal convoluted tubule, this highly coiled structure. And then after that, as you can follow the arrows, the fluid then enters into the collecting duct and ultimately is going to pass out of the kidney. So what we're going to focus on really today and next Tuesday is the, the filtering of the blood and how that fluid from the blood is processed through here, ultimately conserving the things that we need and eliminating the stuff that we don't need. All right, so this is a nice little close-up view. As I mentioned, this is what's known as a nephron. And here's a close-up view. Here's the glomerulus. Here is the capsule. Now, again, just like we've learned before, there's many times more than one name for the same structure. The glomerular capsule, which surrounds the glomerulus, is also known as Bowman's capsule. So if you can kind of envision, um, and if you go back to look at the video, you'll, you'll see it as well. Um, blood enters into the glomerulus, 
through a blood vessel known as the afferent arteriole, this thick vessel. And we'll learn a little bit more about the vasculature later, but just picture blood circulating through their body, your body. Once it enters into the kidney, it goes through this afferent arteriole, goes through this tuft of capillaries known as the glomerulus. The plasma is squeezed across, and then it goes through this journey through the proximal tubules, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and out. And along the way, the composition of this plasma, you know, all the things that are in it, right? The, the ions, nutrients, things like that, waste that are in it, the composition from and here is going to be very different from what's excreted because of what's here are things like as we'll see later, glucose, ions, things that are passing in here, but we don't want to lose them. So these are eventually reabsorbed, but the stuff that remains is the stuff we want to excrete. Oops. Okay. So a little bit of detail about the kidney. I've spoken about blood entering into the kidney. Um, and ultimately, a branch off the aorta are the renal arteries. So you picture like the the aorta, you know, the descending aorta passing into the abdominal cavity, branches off into the renal arteries, and they enter the, the kidneys through what's called the hilus. It's just a kind of a curved area that I'll show you in a second. Just gives you kind of the, the, the amount of blood that passes through the kidney at any given time. At rest, at any given time, the kidney receives 20% of the cardiac output. So if you think about cardiac output being about five liters per minute, the kidney receives one liter per minute. Per unit weight, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty small, pretty small organ, but it it's really receives a lot because this is an organ that's going to be involved in regulating the composition of the blood, right? counts for 1% of the body weight, but it receives 20% of the blood. It accounts for roughly about 16% of the uses of usage of ATP. And it's involved in filtering, in this process of regulating composition is all about filtering. So considering the fact that it's very small in size, it makes up for it by obviously it's very important it's important for a blood to go through there so we can filter all right so just before we get any further this for example is the hilus this area right here so here's our renal artery going in here's our renal vein leaving this is a nice flow chart showing the blood supply of the kidney um, the kidney starts off if, if you if we follow the blood flow um, the renal artery enters into the kidney. It branches into what are called segmental arteries, which subdivide further into what are known as interlobar arteries. These interlobar arteries then branch off into arcuate arteries. And I used to remember, I still remember, the word arcuate sounds like an arc, if you think of this vessel kind of arcing. From the arcuate arteries, the blood then branches off in these vessels into the cortical radiate artery. And then ultimately, what you really can't see here because it's too small, ultimately into the afferent arteriole, which then collects into the glomerulus, the capillaries. Drainage, just like th is through the efferent arteriole into what we call the peritubular capillaries, and then out. Now this is showing the blood supply. What it isn't showing is a lot of material from the blood is not coming back, right? It ends up remaining in the kidney and being eliminated or excreted. So this is the blood flow. For the most part, the arterial vessels are the same as the venous vessels, the names. The only real exception is um, we don't have a segmental vein, but everything else, renal, interlobar, arcuate, cortical radiates, pretty much the same. And then we've got the, the draining vessels. So pretty extensive blood supply. Again, the kidney receives 20% of the cardiac output. All right. And 
at the risk of, of repeating things, this is a really nice picture showing, again, more detail. Just so you can kind of navigate, get a good understanding. Um, if we take a look here, you, know, you sort of wonder, it's like, where do you start? Well, this is showing with the arc, uh, starting with the arcuate artery. So we're like right, we're like right there. And with the arcuate artery, then that continues on into the, as you can see right here, into the inter arcuate, into the interlobular, otherwise known as the cortical radiate. So I apologize, every book is different. Interlobular is the same thing as the cortical radiate. We have interlobar and we have interlobular, which is the same thing as the cortical radiate. So Arcuate artery branches off into the cortical radiate, which then branches into the afferent arteriole, which goes into the glomerulus. And then whatever is not filtered through ends up draining through the efferent arteriole, through this collection of capillaries, the peritubular and the vasa recta, eventually leaving the, the kidney through the interlobular vein, arcuate artery, and so on. So like I mentioned, the kidney is a very, very complicated organ. All right, so that's a little bit of the anatomy. We know that the basic functional unit is a nephron, and there's millions of these in each kidney. Um, we know that the kidney has an extensive blood supply. Well, now let's get down to what actually the kidney is doing. And I mentioned before that the kidney is involved in in essentially regulating fluid volume, blood pressure. That's kind of the big picture, right? But at the basics, oh, that's ultimately what it's doing. But with the basics, what's really going on is fluid is entering into the kidney. And there's three main processes, actually four, that ultimately are going to affect fluid volume. They're ultimately going to affect blood pressure. And these four, um, processes are first of all filtration, glomerular filtration. Filtration is the process in which the blood, and I should really emphasize the plasma, is squeezed out of the glomerulus and enters through Bowman's capsule into the proximal convoluted tubule. Like I said, think of this as like a piece of cheesecloth. That's blood is being forced through, or I should say the plasma. What does not enter into the proximal tubule or in the Bowman's capsule are large substances. Proteins, they're too big to get through, and also blood cells, right? Normally they don't get through. Now, if somebody has a urinary tract infection or a kidney infection, sometimes that will um, change and you will get some blood, uh, some um, red blood cells going into the kidney into the tubule. But normally those uh, substances are excluded, only small particles, and we'll talk about those, things like water, ions, amino acids get through. Once the blood is filtered, right, it's squeezed across into Bowman's capsule, much of what's coming into the kidney, and this is kind of phenomenal to think about this, 99% of the volume that enters into the kidney the course of the day is reabsorbed. What does that mean? That means whatever came in here, all that plasma, 99% of it is brought back into the blood. Um, and as we'll soon see, things like water, much a lot of water, but glucose, amino acids, essential ions. We, we want to keep those. We want to conserve those. So they get reabsorbed back into these peritubular capillaries which to go back for a second, basically though that, are, that it would be things like this right here, efferent arterial peritubular capillaries. Whatever is not filtered is going to end up back in those capillaries. All right, so like I said, 99% of what goes in ends up being reabsorbed. Um, there's another, that's called reabsorption. We also have another property called secretion. There are certain substances that are not filtered here, um, they remain in the blood, but some of them need to be, need to enter into the kidney. And this is what we call secretion. 
So this is kind of confusing. It's like you think, well, if substances are small enough to get through here, why don't that why doesn't everything come through here? Right? Well, typically the nutrients, the water, the ions come through this fashion. But what doesn't come through are things like metabolic waste, um, toxins, drug metabolites. Let's say, for example, if you're taking an antibiotic, you want to excrete that. That doesn't come through here. It comes through this movement from the peritubular capillaries back into the tubules. That's what we call secretion. So metabolic waste toxins enter through this way. That's C. At the end of these three processes, we then have the composition of what's going to be excreted as urine. So filtration, reabsorption, secretion, all contribute to what's going to be excreted. All right, so I put a little equation in here. Um, the urinary excretion of a substance depends on how much is filtered, how much is reabsorbed, so we subtract out what's being reabsorbed, we add in what's being secreted, and we end up with how much is going to be excreted. So say, for example, I'll say, say if we start off with 100 mils, 100 milliliters. Well, I mentioned 99% is being reabsorbed, so that means 99 goes in, all we have is one. And say, for example, we secrete another mil, so that means we'll excrete two mils. And that's about right in the sense that during the course of a typical day, um, and we'll take a look at certain measurements of kidney function, like a filtration rate, roughly about 180 liters of fluid goes into the kidney each day. That's 180 quarts. Of those 180 quarts, we only excrete about a liter, one liter. So, and a lot of that's due to the reabsorption. All right. So I'm gonna mention just a couple different terms um, and we'll talk about some equations later. So the amount of substance that's excreted is equal to the amount that's filtered at the glomerulus, the amount that's secreted, plus the amount that's secreted minus what's reabsorbed. Now these two events, the secretion and the reabsorption, of course, are occurring at the tubules, right in the tubules. Whereas whereas filtration is occurring right here between the glomerulus and the capsule. Okay, so the amount excreted depends on three factors, what we call the filtered load, the secretion rate, and the reabsorption rate. And here's kind of one way to look at it. It's kind of common sense, but it's good to write it down. If the amount of solute, and I'm using the term solute I mean, what we're looking at as substances that are dissolved in plasma, right? If the amount of solute excreted per minute is less than the amount filtered, that means that particular solute was reabsorbed. So say, for example, if we have, I don't know, 10 milligrams of sodium that, was, that entered into the kidney, but we end up excreting only eight, that means it was reabsorbed. If the amount of solute excreted per minute is greater than the filter load or what was filtered, solute was secreted. So say, for example, if we end up having, oh, I'll just throw something at substance X entered into the kidney at five liters, uh, five milligrams, and we ended up excreting seven, that means we're excreting more than what was filtered so that difference is accounted for by the secretion, right? This extra, uh, the secretion. If the amount that's excreted ends up of a, of a particular substance, so I'm referring to that individual thing. If the amount of a substance that's filtered, and then we look at the amount that's excreted, and the amount that's excreted is a smaller number, that means much of it was reabsorbed. So it's Kind of common sense, but it's sometimes you have to step back and analyze that. All right, so here's kind of a perfect example of how it all works. And the numbers for this case aren't necessarily important. I mean, every substance is gonna be different when we're looking at glucose, when we're looking at sodium. 
But let's just say, for example, we have a substance that's filtered and it's about 12 millimole are filtered. So if 12 millimoles are filtered across the glomerulus and enter into Bowman's capsule, right? Um, of that, so we have 12 millimole. Now there's also a small amount of that solute that's secreted. So we'll add another three to that. So we have 12 plus three. So 12 came in this way, three came in that way, but we also reabsorbed six. We have reabsorbed six. So that leaves us with nine millimole, right? So that's how we come up with that's going to be excreted. Uh, water, most of water is reabsorbed. Say if we filtered 150 mils of water, we basically end up, um, we didn't secrete any, we reabsorbed about 145 mils, we only excrete about five. So I don't want you to get too concerned with the number scheme, but I'm just trying to show you how we end up with urine. We filter stuff, um, some substances that aren't filtered, we may have a, and I know I mentioned that certain things that are secreted are not filtered, but occasionally we do get kind of some the same things that are filtered, some are also secreted, although not a lot. Um, this, these two add to the excretion and then we reabsorb some and that ends up being our difference. So this is kind of interesting too. In addition to looking at the different processes, um, the other thing you can look at as the concentration. So one of the things being that we're land animals, right, we're, con we're always concerned about our fluid intake, right, and fluid loss, right? Well, if you look at this example, whatever the substance was, 12 millimole of it in 150 mils of water. At the end, we're excreting nine millimole in five mils of water. It's much more concentrated, right? And that's what we want. We want to excrete as concentrated substance as possible which, and that's important because we, this allows us to reabsorb much of the water. All right, okay. So, so you take a look at again, filtration is the filtrate or, of blood or the plasma leaves the glomerulus, enters into the capsule. What gets reabsorbed? Most nutrients, most, I mean, water and essential ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, mostly return to the blood. And lastly, we have secretion. What is secreted typically undesirable molecules from blood, from the blood back to the tubules. Um, like I mentioned, there is, can sometimes be, most substances are filtered, but occasionally some more might trickle in. That safe substance, substance might trickle in by secretion. So hopefully you've got an idea of what I'm trying to get across here. And if not, definitely let me know. Okay. So where do, oops, where does, ah, why is it doing that? Where does filtration occur? As you know, filtration occurs at the renal corpuscle. So as we've learned throughout the semester, for example, the function of a particular tissue or an organ is dependent upon its structure, right? Muscles contract because they have the sarcomere arrangement, right? Nerves communicate because they generate action potentials, right? Um, what's occurring at the kidney, at the renal corpuscle? Well, if just to kind of navigate through, this is the glomerulus. This is the afferent arterial that's coming in. And of course, as I mentioned, blood is being squeezed or plasma is being squeezed across and whatever is filtered goes into there. Whatever is not filtered ends up in the efferent arterioles, into the peritubular capillaries, and so forth, okay? So whenever we talk about filtering, um, important thing to remember is, you know, as far as if you think about it, you don't want, we want to be able to regulate what gets through. So we have what's known as the filtration membrane. This is the filtration membrane. Now, where is this what, what is this comprised of and where is it located? 
The filtration membrane consists of three parts. The capillary endothelium, remember the simple squamous cells that line a capillary, and in the case of the kidney, they're fenestrated. So you remember those pores between the cells? So that's going to allow some small molecules to get through, right? Just outside the capillary endothelium, we've got the basal lamina, which is kind of this glue that holds the capillary endothelium. And the next layer, which is called the podocyte layer, it holds them together. What do we know about podocytes? It's probably something you may not have heard of before. Podocyte is a, is a cell, and you can take a look at it here. This is the nucleus. It has all these little pseudopodia or extensions. Um, the best analogy I could give you would be to think of astrocytes. Not necessarily in function, although there are some similarities, but just in their, their structure. So we have these, all these podocytes that are wrapping around the glomerulus. They're wrapping around the capillary with these little extensions, kind of hugging it. If you remember the astrocytes in the brain, remember they help make up the blood-brain barrier. Well, these podocytes that wrap around the capillary in between all these little extensions with processes, there is a little space, as you can see right here, this little, filter, what we call a filtration slit, right? If you look at the size of the fenestrations, and then look at the size of the filtration slit, you'll notice it's smaller, right? So this is a second layer of filtering. So many substances that might get through here won't get through here and they end up going back. This is more of a selective filtration that allows only the smallest of molecules to get through and eventually making into Bowman's capsule. So filtration membrane is made up of three layers, capillary endothelium, Podocytes and the basal lamina. If you remember the respiratory membrane, remember that was the capillary endothelium, the basal lamina, and the alveolar cells. So there's kind of a kind of a consistency here. All right. So back up again. I apologize for this. I keep doing this. Ah. So that's filtration. Now, just like with any physiological process where we're looking at diffusion with fixed law, when we're, we're looking at um, pressure volume regulation with Boyle's law, whether we're looking at blood flow with Pasui's law, measuring it, filtration is also measured. And the measurement is a term known as the glomerular filter, filtration rate or the GFR. This is very clinically important. Some of you guys that are already working at a clinic, you might be familiar with this term. If not, you will be um, as you enter into the allied health profession. This is a very good assessment of how your kidneys are working. And the filtration rate is the movement of plasma, namely protein-free plasma, from the glomerulus to Bowman's capsule. And this amounts to what amounts to about 180 liters per day as I mentioned before, um, translates this into 125 mils per minute. So this is the target. This is what the GFR should be. If it's, if it's too low, it means your kidneys are failing, probably, possibly. If it's too high, that might mean your blood pressure is too high. And blood, if the blood pressure is off, that can influence the kidneys, much as the kidneys can actually regulate blood pressure. So there's kind of a a dual regulation here. Um, so as I mentioned before, the glomerular filtrate, which is really just another name for the protein-free plasma, must cross three barriers, the capillary endothelial layer, the surrounding epithelial layer, which, is, which, which are the podocytes, and then the basement membrane or the basal lamina. So just remember that term, 125 mils per minute. Okay, so just like with any process that we talk about in the body, there's always factors that are going to influence that. Remember with blood flow, we looked at blood viscosity can influence it. 
blood vessel length, pressure, and radius. Um, when we are looking at um, Lav Laplace, remember we looked at radius, we looked at, at pressure, we looked at also surface tension, right? GFR is influenced by what we call starling forces. I know that sounds like a very fancy term, but it's named for a person named Starling, who was very well known in many aspects of physiology, um, whether it's digestive physiology or even cardiac physiology. GFR is governed by three pressures. We have pressures that will favor filtration, going in the same direction of it. And we have pressure that goes, that is not, does not favor filtration or it pushes in the opposite direction, okay? We basically have one pressure that favors GFR and that is what we call the glomerular hydrostatic pressure, which is just basically the same as blood pressure, right? The blood pressure coming in puts pressure comes into the glomerulus and helps to push or squeeze the fluid out, right? So that's going to be a positive pressure. We then have opposing pressures. We ha also have what's called colloidal osmotic pressure or plasma pressure um, osmot or plasma osmotic pressure. Um, this is measured or this is this is determined by the amount of protein that's in the blood. Remember I mentioned that protein does not get filtered, right? Protein stays in the blood. Well, as you know, with, if you think of osmolarity, right, water is going to flow in the concentration where there's greater solute concentration. So even though we have blood pressure, hydrostatic pressure going this way, some of the fluid is also going to be drawn backwards to help to kind of stabilize the osmolarity of the blood. That's the colloidal pressure. Second of all, as the, or yeah, the third pressure, but the second in the negative, um, as the fluid is filtered across the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule, as this fluid builds up, it pushes, it pushes back. That's what we call Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure. So as you can see right here, um, we have glomerular hydrostatic pressure promotes outward flow going in this direction. Capsular hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure push it this way. So again, going back, it is throwback Thursday, I guess. Um, when we're talking about capillaries, remember a while back when we were looking at blood vessels, we were talking about the arterial end and the venous end and how we filter blood and how we reabsorb it and the balance between the hydrostatic and the osmotic pressure. Same thing is true here. Some books actually use an example, I think an analogy book of like a sumo wrestler. A sumo wrestler is on the mat and right, someone's pushing against them. And basically depending on which pressure is greater is going to win, right? In this case, we want the glomerular hydrostatic pressure to exceed both these two opposing pressures. All right, so let's take a look. All right. So let's give let's take a look at some numbers, some average numbers. So the the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries or the blood pressure is about 55 millimeters of mercury at the at the glomerulus. Obviously, in our circulation, it's higher, but at the glomerulus, it's about 55 millimeters of mercury. That's the positive pressure. The the Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure. That's the fluid that's in that small area is about 15. So we've got 15 going the opposite direction. And then we've got the osmotic pressure, which is due to the proteins drawing fluid back into the blood, that's about 30. So if we pop that into the equation, we have 55 going this way, 30 going back, 15 going back, that gives us a positive net pressure of 10, which is all we need as long as this is positive, right? If for some reason these two pressures exceed the, the uh, glomerular hydrostatic pressure, that's a problem. Your kidneys are not filtering and that's the result in or may already be indicative of renal, renal failure. So 
This is what we call the net filtration pressure. We need that to be positive. And these are some of the terms used, if you want to get, just get familiar with it. So pH is the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus. Pi, which always shows up, <laughs> is the colloidal osmotic pressure. And then the P fluid, of course, is the pressure of fluid in Bowman's capsule. All right. So let's take what we know already. And there's also other, I, I just changed the terms, I apologize for this, but basically filtration pressure is equal to the pressure um, within the glomerular capsule or, or the glomerulus minus the combination of the colloidal osmotic pressure in the glomerulus and the pressure in Bowman's capsule. So that gives us a positive 10. Um, I'm just throwing this number out now just to become familiar with this. We're going to discuss it later. Renal plasma flow is another indication of flow rate into the kidney. So we're looking at different things. Renal plasma flow is the blood that's coming into the glomerulus. It's not the amount that's being, that's being filtered, right? So 625 milliliters per minute come in, um, that's the renal plasma flow, comes into the glomerulus. 125 is filtered. So that's how we come up with roughly our 20%. Right, if you take 125 over 625, let me just let me just take a look here. I should uh, hold on one second here. Da, 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 da. Uh, 125 divided by 625. Yeah, exactly 20%. So and that means the remaining blood ends up going, that is not filtered, the 125 ends up going back into the efferent arterial and so on. Okay, so a lot of math here, but you guys got this. Okay, so again, just to take a look at another chart, <clears throat> just to show you a couple, a couple things and then to kind of make some comments. So the volume of fluid, obviously, that's entering into Bowman's capsule is about 180 liters per day, right? Which is equivalent to 125 mils per minute. Of that 125, 125 mils per minute, or 180 liters per day, we only excrete about one and a half liters, which means, as I mentioned before, the bulk is reabsorbed, right? Um, this is showing as the, the volume of fluid as it passes through these different compartments. And you can see already the amount of reabsorption that's occurring by the time it reaches the proximal tubule, the amount of reabsorption that's occurring at the loop of Henle, and finally at the end. So yes, there's secretion, but the overall overwhelming factor here is reabsorption. All right. Um, and the term that I used for um, that 20% of, of blood is filtered is also known as the filtration fraction. So that 125 over 625 is also known as the filtration fraction. So a lot of interesting terms associated with the kidney. <clears throat> All right. And this is basically showing it. So the filtration fraction, these are the terms. And this basically says it all. So this is an excellent clinical marker. Someone has, a, if, if the, assuming that the renal blood flow is 625, unless someone has some other cardiovascular issues, which are entirely possible, if their filtration fraction is low, something's going on in the kidney. If, for example, if for some reason, maybe the, G, the, um, um, the GFR is fine, but maybe the amount of blood coming in is very low, maybe due to some atherosclerosis, so the, the uh, renal blood flow is low, that's going to be less. So again, 
the kidney can be affected by its own maybe pathologies, and it can also be affected by pathologies in the cardiovascular system, which is pretty much true with everything, right? If you look at the respiratory system, that's influenced by the cardiovascular, the digestive system, you can digest, have some really good food, but if there's a problem with the circulation and you're unable to absorb nutrients into the blood, that's a problem. So having a healthy cardiovascular system is important for the success of all of our systems. All right. And again, I know I got a little carried away with these pictures, but they're just kind of fun. All right, so 180 liters per day, 180 liters of fluid are filtered per day, only one and a half liters of urine is excreted per day. That it tells us that about 99% of filtered fluid is reabsorbed, as you already know. Now the GFR, <clears throat> which is 125, you might wonder, it's like, well, you know, what, I mentioned that it's regulated based upon the pressures, right? that of those different factors that play a role. But there's also other things that play a role in GFR, right? So to back up for a second, GFR, the 125 mils per minute, that's the amount of fluid that's filtered across the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule, that's in large part determined by the filtration fraction, right? That essentially, and the amount of the pressures, if you've got a good capillary hydrostatic pressure, if, you, if that exceeds the opposing pressures, that's going to favor filtration. That's going to maintain the GFR. So that pressure, those differences, the osmotic pressure, the Bowman capsule pressure, the um, glomerular hydrostatic pressure, those all contribute to GFR tremendously. But we have other, other different components that can regulate it very well as well. And in our body, we always have these backup systems, right, that are, that are involved. Okay. Um, first one I want to take a look at is what's called myogenic regulation. And this involves the cardiovascular system in the sense that, remember the tunica media. The tunica media, especially in the arterioles, remember, is primarily involved in regulating blood flow. And previously, we had mentioned to different organs in the body, right? Just kind of systemically, the arterioles help to regulate blood flow, maintain the velocity so it's not too fast going into the capillaries, can divert blood to different areas by their di dilation or their constriction. Well, in the capillaries, it's a little, it a little bit different. Um, what happens is, say, for example, we have our blood pressure goes up for whatever reason, say it's maybe transient or if someone has a blood pressure problem. Well, normally the kidney responds or the afferent arterioles respond to an increase in blood pressure. And this could be you know, the, the systolic pressure, maybe the heart's pumping harder. This causes the afferent arterioles to stretch, right? It's putting pressure on the muscle. The afferent arterioles stretch and then what they do not only do they not only do they then constrict but they get even smaller so think of it like they start off like a rubber band they stretch out when as the blood's coming through but then they constrict to a diameter that's even smaller than the original size so, so for example let me sort of uh go to i'm not an artist as you guys know but let's see let me go to share screen. Um, all right, so you, hopefully you guys got this, all, all that information. But when I'm talking about the arterial, so say for example, the arterial diameter is normally about like that, right? So I'll just put N for normal, right? Then we have a surge in blood pressure the afferent arterial, especially the, the uh, tunica media is going to stretch. So I'm gonna put increase BP, right? Then when following that, with the recoiling, 
what's going to happen is the afferent arterial is going to get like this, right? And that helps what that does is that as the blood pressure goes up, that's going to increase the renal blood flow. That's going to push more blood into the glomerulus, but it's can potentially damage the kidneys. So by decreasing the volume, that is helping to stabilize the BP and thereby preventing the uh, GFR from going too high or going up. Like I said, we want to keep the, the GFR at 125. If the blood pressure goes up and we don't have a way of regulating that, the GFR is going to go up and we can actually get damage to the kidneys. So this is a way of sort of reducing or monitoring the blood flow. All right, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Um, okay. All right, so that's basically, so it contracts in response to, or basically, uh, it, it stretches and then it contracts. So stretches and then contracts, which will decrease the blood flow. That's what we call the myogenic regulation. Myogenic, it's just the arterioles, the muscle of the arterioles. We also have what's known as the tubuloglomerular feedback. And this involves a specialized cell in the distal convoluted tubule, we'll learn about in a bit, called the macula densa cells. These cells, it's very interesting. So to kind of um, pause for a second, both of these mechanisms, myogenic and tubular glomerular feedback, we're looking at their response to an increase in blood pressure for now. Let's just say an increase in blood pressure. So when blood pressure goes up, the arterial muscles stretch and they contract to a small size to help to reduce the blood flow to maintain B BP. Say, for example, that blood got through the, the, so we still have the blood pressure problem, but say we have some blood being filtered, gets into the tubules, this plasma gets through the tubules. We have a backup system. I mean, not to minimize the importance of this, but it's a secondary system that, that actually monitors the solute concentration inside the tubules, right? This process is monitoring the blood pressure and responding accordingly. This is monitoring the concentration of solute and fluid in the tubules, which is basically an indirect way of saying, okay, we must have had a huge increase in GFR because there's more fluid in here. So what happens is these macula densa cells squirt out a substance called adenosine, which triggers the smooth muscles of the arterioles to contract. So to kind of look at the big picture, because it can get really convoluted, um, both of these responses are ultimately going to lead to a constriction of the arterioles. Myogenic regulation is much more direct. Blood pressure is pushing on the walls, causing them to stretch, and then a rapid recoiling to a small size to reduce blood flow to keep making sure that high blood pressure doesn't reach the kidneys. In this case, we've got, say, blood is flowing. It's already been filtered. We've got this plasma that's in the kidneys. Because the GFR was too high, we have more solute and more fluid. These cells, the macula densa cells, sense that and they think, okay, so we've got too much sodium, too much water, the blood pressure is way too high here. So they're going to squirt out adenosine, and that adenosine is going to tell the arterioles to contract. So I'll, I'll show you a couple more pictures, which hopefully will explain that um, in just a bit. Okay, so let's take a close up view of the myogenic response. Like they say, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, this is a, a normal scenario. This is a scenario, here you've got Bowman's capsule. Here you've got the glomerulus. Here you've got the afferent arterial. Here you've got the efferent arterial, right? We've got blood that's coming through. So pay particular attention to this big arrow and these arrows and the diameter of the afferent arterial. Okay, see what happens if the blood pressure goes up. Okay, 
So basically blood pressure went up and what happened? The afferent arterial constricted. The afferent arterial constricted where it's going to ultimately reduce or help to level off the GFR. So in response to high blood pressure, there's a constriction of the afferent arterial, which will reduce the renal blood flow, the amount of blood coming in. And by reducing the renal blood flow, we're going to reduce the GFR. So compare that to this right here, right? Here you've got Professor it. Crown? Yes. Uh, you still have your um, screen sharing on. We can only see your picture. We don't see the PowerPoint. Oh, no. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, Holy cow. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to see me. Um, let's see. Share screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure how many slides I went through, but let's see. Um, I'm, did, you, did you guys see this? Yes. You saw this? Yes. And this, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, thank you for letting me know. All right, so anyway, so this is what it normally looks like. This is when, when if blood pressure goes up, what happens is there's this vasoconstriction, which, which helps to keep the renal blood flow at bay so GFR doesn't get high. GFR gets too high, you're gonna damage the kidneys. All right. So you got, you're still seeing the pictures now? We're, on, we're back on track? Yes. Hmm. All right, thank you. All right, so I've spoken about what happens if blood pressure gets too high, but what about blood pressure getting too low, right? So this is a really cool diagram graph which illustrates how effective the body is at maintaining GFR. This on the x-axis, we have mean arterial blood pressure. Just think of this as blood pressure. This is the GFR. And you can see right here, between a range of blood pressure of about 180 to 80, it doesn't matter whether the blood pressure is 80 or 180, we're still able to maintain that GFR. And this is again, due to that myogenic response, right? as well as the tubular glomerular response, we do a really good job at keeping things at bay as long as the blood pressure is between, this is a pretty wide range if you think about it. I mean, this is pretty low blood pressure, but we're still able to maintain, I mean, the GFR just by different actions of the arteries. What happens if the blood pressure gets too low? What happens if the blood pressure drops? Well, notice what happens we no longer maintain the GFR. The GFR is decreased. And you think, well, God, this isn't good. I mean, the, the blood pressure, you'd think we'd want to maintain the GFR. Well, this is actually a really cool adaptive response. If the blood pressure is exceedingly low, that indicates that there's some sort of fluid loss, whether it be hemorrhaging or something like that. Someone's got internal bleeding. Well, if someone's internal bleeding, bleeding internally, the last thing you want is to keep filtering blood through the kidneys, right? You don't want to lose any more. So basically, when the blood pressure drops to a certain point, you basically, large extent, shut down GFR. It's a protective measure, at least temporarily, to prevent any more fluid loss through the kidneys. This up here at the other end, if the blood pressure gets too high, this is actually a problem, right? The, the, the body can no longer regulate. Um, if, the, if someone's blood pressure gets to like 200 or beyond, we know that's kind of outside the effective regulatory capacity of the body, right? So, so we're good here. Obviously, this is not a good situation if we're hemorrhaging, but by decreasing the GFR, it prevents any further blood loss. So kind of a protective measure. All right. Um, so this is kind of a summary. I kind of, it's a, there's a lot on this picture and I didn't want to get too bogged down in all the details, but basically this kind of illustrates 
how we respond to a decrease in blood pressure. Some of which you guys already know. If we take a look at the cardiovascular response, right? So say for example, they're talking about hemorrhaging. Um, sweating, uh, that would actually be, that's a fluid loss. That would be, someone would have to sweat a heck of a lot. But let's just focus on hemorrhaging. So excessive hemorrhaging, decrease in blood volume, decrease in pressure. This activates the baroreceptors, right? As we know, like the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies. They send signals back up to the, the brain, which activates the sympathetic system, right? And the sympathetic system, what does that do? That actually leads to a constriction of the afferent, of the, um, afferent arterioles, which will lead to a decrease in GFR, which will lead to a decrease in urine flow. So this is very interesting. So we common think of, you know, we think of as like an increase in blood pressure, we wanna reduce the blood flow, right? Because it, the kidney could be damaged if there's too much pressure on the kidney. In this case, we're reducing the blood flow into the kidney because we don't want more blood to be filtered. We don't want to excrete any more urine. So we're going, so as a result, that prevents us against fluid loss. So again, this you already know about, right? In response to low blood pressure, but this is just the additional kidney response to low blood pressure where there's a vasoconstriction of the, the uh, kidney arterioles, which will ultimately decrease GFR which is a protective measure in this case. All right, so a little summary. Um, increased blood pressure stretches the, this is the myogenic response. Increased blood pressure stretches the afferent arterioles, tunica media, with subsequent recoiling to cause vasoconstriction, results in increased resistance and subsequent decrease in renal blood flow and GFR, right? We want, we don't, we want to, reduce or maintain the GFR, we don't want it to go up, which it, we don't want the GFR to go up, which it would if we didn't have this response. And if the GFR goes up too high, we're gonna have kidney damage. If blood pressure falls below 80, there is no vasodilation basically, and um, we, there's a decrease in GFR due to vasoconstriction. The idea is to conserve fluid volume. So what we're talking about here is what's going on with the afferent arterial. But what about the efferent? We don't often refer to the efferent that much. Um, in the case of the efferent arterial, what can actually um, sometimes happen in response to uh, low, uh, bl low blood pressure or whatever, if you constrict the efferent arterial, the effect is actually the opposite if you constrict the afferent. Let me show you why. If you constrict the afferent, what's going to happen? Less blood, we're going to reduce renal blood flow. We're going to reduce the GFR, right? If we constrict the efferent arterial, there's no outlets. We're reducing the, the outer blood flow. So what's happening? Blood is building up in here and we're going to increase GFR. So what are the circumstances we see this? I mean, it's debatable. Some people say that we see this with sympathetic activity, but I'm not, I haven't found a consensus of when this occurs. I don't think it's that, it's that major of a factor. Most of the changes in the vasculature are due to changes with the afferent arterial. But I just wanted to mention that if the efferent arterial constricts, it's going to prevent the outflow. So we're gonna get a buildup of pressure, which is going to increase the GFR. Whereas we, if we constrict the afferent arterial, that's going to reduce the blood flow in and it's going to decrease GFR. All right, let's talk a bit about the tubuloglomerular feedback. And remember that was one of those two, uh, two processes besides the pressures. Uh, in the uh, starling forces that regulate GFR. One was the myogenic response and the other was the tubuloglomerular feedback, right? So first let's kind of navigate our way through. Here's the glomerulus, 
Here's the afferent arteriole. Here's the efferent arteriole. Here is a cross section through the um, distal convoluted tubule. And maybe part of the loop of Henle, but also this is more prominent in the distal convoluted tubule. There's the, the uh, proximal tubule. So you can kind of see, it's kind of hard to imagine, but just picture this as the distal tubule. Okay, so how does this work? Okay. Well, there's a region within here, and I think I've got another picture of it. Uh, uh, where did I put it? Jeez, I guess this is it. Okay. Um, yeah. So this region within the glomerular area is known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So what does that mean? The juxtaglomerular apparatus consists of two distinct cell types. What we call the macula densa, which are these kind of dark staining cells of the, D, of the distal convoluted tubule or the DCT. And these cells right along the afferent arteriole, these are called granular cells. So we have granular cells and we have macula densa cells that are in communication with each other. Okay. Much like I mentioned previously when I was introducing this tubular glomerular feedback to you. I mentioned that as fluids filtering through the kidney, right? Uh, let me find this right. Filtering through the proximal tubule, loop of Henle. When it reaches the distal tubule, we have these cells up here called the macula densa. And if they sense there's high levels of sodium or solute volume, that's indicative that the GFR is too high. So they will squirt a substance, which is now known as adenosine. At, at the time of this, when this came out, they just called it the paracrine. Adenosine is secreted from these macula densa cells, stimulates these granular cells to contract. And when they contract, this causes the afferent arteriole to contract. All right. So the tubular glomerular feedback is an interplay between the macula densa of the tubules and the granular cells of the afferent arteriole to ultimately decrease GFR. Remember with the myogenic response, that was a direct effect of blood flow causing this blood vessel to dilate first and then constrict. All right, so this is really a summary of the tubular glomerular feedback, as you can see right here. Say GFR increases, there's an increase in flow through the tubules. By the time you get to the distal tubule, the macula densa cells, which are the chemoreceptors, they sense, it's like, okay, there's too much, too much solute here, too much fluid. They're gonna squirt out adenosine, which is going to stimulate constriction of the afferent arteriole which is ultimately going to bring GFR back to where it should be. All right, let me just take a look for a second. Let's see where I'm at right here, 35. Okay. Um, now we're 10. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and start the, at the, the um, hold on a second. I'm gonna go ahead and start the absorption process and then we'll, we'll stop maybe in about 10 minutes or so. All right, um, are you guys able to see the slide that says reabsorption? Yes? No? Yeah, yeah we can. Cool, okay. All right, so what we spent this exhaustive amount of time on, <laughs> 35 slides mostly, 30 slides, whatever, is on filtration. That's the first step, right? So you get the, the filtrate in, in, through, the glomer, through the glomerulus, cross the Bowman's capsule. Now we're starting to take a look at the next two steps, which are the reabsorption and secretion, which are occurring in the tubules, all right? So reabsorption, if you remember, is the movement of fluid, movement of solutes from the tubules primarily occurs in the proximal, but it can occur in any of the tubules. It moves it into the peritubular capillary, basically returning it into the blood. 
this is not anything that we have any system that can regulate. Most of this is just occurs due to a variety of different transport mechanisms. So this is where things go full circle. We're going to revisit again secondary active transport, facilitated diffusion, all that. So this is pretty much all transport driven. All right. Um, I'm not going to have you memorize all these numbers, but I do want you just to have some idea of the extent of which things are absorbed. So again, going from the kidney back into the blood, look at all these things, right? Glucose, urea, um, some urea is, re is reabsorbed because it can go into making proteins and things like that. A lot of ions, and of course, bicarbonate, we know that's important because that's a nice buffer right, for the blood. Look at the extent of all this reabsorption. Normally, as you can see right here, a lot of the stuff is almost completely reabsorbed. There's some exceptions. Um, in a little bit, we're going to focus on glucose. Um, particularly interesting, I think, because of, of course, the role of glucose and sugar regulation in diabetes, right? You take a look at this picture, under normal circumstances, all the glucose that enters into the kidney is reabsorbed. But of course we know, if anyone has known any diabetics or familiar with diabetes, one of the, these characteristics of diabetes is sugar in the urine. So we're gonna take a look and see how this happens. Not right now, but a little bit. Okay. So principles of reabsorption, it's the transport of substances from the tubule lumens into the blood, and that's where the R comes in. So there's the F for filtration, R for reabsorption, and then later we'll take a look at secretion. So you can see reabsorption can pretty much occur anywhere throughout the tubules, although it's mostly in the initial segment, which is the proximal tubule. Okay, um, I'm gonna introduce some terms to you and some definitions, and this will come into play later. Um, the term renal threshold, and I apologize for all the text, but sometimes you got to do it that way just to, to get the point across. The term renal threshold. The renal threshold is a term used to describe the plasma level of a substance in which all of it basically, um, oh yeah, I should, let me back up. The plasma level of a substance in which anything above that is not reabsorbed and goes into the into the kidney. Okay, I didn't exactly word that that well. The the there whatever the number is for the renal threshold for a particular substance, that's the plasma concentration. So say I'll just throw a number out. So say for example glucose. Say say the renal threshold for glucose is 100. 100 um, milligrams. I'll just throw that out right? Say you've got 100 milligrams in your blood, right? Well, all of that is going to be reabsorbed. But say if you've got 120 in your blood, 100 will be reabsorbed, but 20 will end up going into the kidney and you, you'll end up peeing that out, all right? So that's the renal threshold. And the example I like to use is if you think of a dam, right? A dam, you know, obviously is something, it's a wall that's put up a concrete wall. It's like a flood control, right? Um, this is analogous to a dam, and only when the water level becomes too high does the water spill over the dam, right? So in other words, if glucose is at 100, it's going to stay on the back of the dam. But if glucose gets to 120, it's going to spill over, and it's going to spill over into the urine, all right? All substances have their particular renal threshold. It's not, it's not the same for all. Glucose has a particular one, and I'll share that with you shortly. Um, I found this, this picture. Some of you might be familiar with this. This is an example of kind of the um, little bit about how blood glucose works. Um, this is, if any of you have ever had a, a glucose tolerance test, say if someone is suspected of being hyperglycemic or pre-diabetic or even diabetic, one way you can test that is by taking a very sugary solution at the doctors, and then every 15 minutes or thereabouts, they measure your blood level of sugar. And what normally happens 
is this is the this is right before you consumed it as you as the blood the glucose enters into your blood from your intestines right blood sugar levels go up and then in about an hour it peaks and then it goes down by two the reason for this going down is of course we'll learn later is the role of insulin right blood sugar goes up and then it goes down this is someone who's diabetic and first of all notice that their normal threat their renal threshold is their their uh um, their blood sugar level is at 150, right? To start, that's too high. Normally, your blood sugar level should, at rest should be about 70 to 100. So this is about 150, which is high to begin with. They consume more sugar in this test. Goes up, as you might expect. It peaks at an hour, which you would expect. But look how long it takes to come down long, it doesn't get back to baseline for five hours. One of the things we'll learn is we've, this person has exceeded the renal threshold. So a lot of this blood sugar is ending up spilling into the urine. Okay. So again, I'm just throwing that out for you on the surface. We'll go into more details about it later to clarify it, but I just kind of want to introduce it to you because it is a really interesting way of studying um, sugar by looking at diabetics. All right. So speaking of glucose, so glucose, as, I, we, as we mentioned earlier, is normally, going back to that previous table, glucose is normally 100% reabsorbed. 100% reabsorbed. So whatever glucose ends up going into the kidney tubules, all of it ends up being returned to the blood, normally, right? Um, how is it returned to the blood? Well, this will be a nice refresher for you. First of all, through SGLT, remember the sodium glucose link transporter. This secondary active transport glucose enters from the kidney tubule into the, from the lumen into the kidney cell. Once the, the glucose is in the kidney cell, it undergoes facilitated diffusion via the glute transporter, eventually making its way into the blood. Right. So secondary active transport facilitated diffusion, high concentration to low, glucose is now into the blood. And that's normally how, that's when things are working well, all of the glucose gets in. And of course, this is the whole sodium story, which we'll talk about later with the ATPase. All right. All right, so I've mentioned to you renal threshold. I wanna mention another term called the transport maximum. This is, and, and the name itself is, is very uh, self-explanatory. This is when the transport maximum, the, the maximum amount of solute that can be transported from the kidneys lumen back into the blood. The maximum amount when the carriers are saturated. Now, what do I mean by carrier? I'm referring to SGLT. And probably GLUT2, but mostly SGLT. Oops, we have a finite number of SGLT proteins. There's only a certain number, right? So what happens is if, if we have, if when normally when glucose enters into the kidney, all these carriers are able to accommodate all of the glucose and basically they're transported by the carrier proteins back into the capillary. But there's a time when we're gonna saturate the carriers, that we've got all the carriers are saturated, they're, they're transporting as much glucose as possible, right? And once that occurs, right, so we're able to reabsorb everything. If a solute saturate carrier, if a solute infilt, if the solute infiltrate saturates the carriers, or basically, uh, then some solute is excreted in the urine. Solute in the plasma that causes solute infiltrate to saturate carriers and spill over to the urine, it's renal threshold. Okay, so let me let me let me take a look at this for a second here. Okay, so you can watch this picture or also just listen to me. So there's a renal threshold for glucose, and I'll just mention the number to you. It's 180, right? So if we've got 180 milli, 
uh, roughly 180 milligrams of glucose in the blood, right? We basically saturated all the carriers and we've actually maximized the transport. We're, we're, we're transporting the maximum amount of glucose when we're at 180. When we're at 180 and we're reabsorbing all of it, when we're at 185 or beyond, the carriers cannot accommodate that. And so as a result, we're going to get glucose showing up into the urine. Normally, no glucose shows up in the urine because it's all being reabsorbed. We typically don't saturate all the carriers, right? And of course, you might ask, why is there so much glucose uh, being in there? It's because, as we'll soon see later, it's because of insulin, right? We've got high blood sugar. We've got high blood sugar going into the kidneys. The carriers can only transport so much. What isn't transported ends up, in, in, ends up in the urine. All right, so the carrier proteins for glucose are SGLT at the apical membrane or between the lumen and the cell itself. And then we have GLUT, which is the transporter between the cell itself and the basal lateral surface into the blood. All right, all right, so this is kind of an, I'm gonna end with this particular diagram. and Hopefully this will explain. I know it's very, very, this is really a, a tough, tough topic but um, again, I'll answer any questions, go over with you, but I'm trying to kind of give you as much, many tools as possible to understand it. So let's take a look at glucose. So um, if we take a look, this is the plasma concentration of glucose. This is the rate of glucose movement, right? <clears throat> All right, so as we increase the amount of glucose, in the, in the blood, you would expect that glucose is gonna be transported, right? I mean, where we're gonna filter it, I should say. The more glucose that goes into the glomerulus, into the Bowman's capsule, is going to be filtered. So there's a nice correlation. No matter how much glucose or how little, there's a direct relationship between the amount of glucose and the amount that's filtered. That's a given. And there's also a direct relationship between the amount of glucose and the amount that's being reabsorbed. And you can see right here, this is the reabsorption. It's all reabsorbed, all reabsorbed. When we have 100 milligrams of glucose, we have 100 milligrams being reabsorbed. When we have 175, it's all being reabsorbed, right? Only when we get to about this point right here, which is known as the renal threshold, which, which is about 180, we can't, we no longer have 100% reabsorption. We're starting to level off, right? And that's because we've reached the renal threshold. At renal threshold, the carrier proteins are saturated and any excess glucose is going to spill into the urine which you can start to see occurring at the same time. So at the same time, we're sort of leveling off our reabsorption because we can't reabsorb anymore. What isn't reabsorbed is ends up going into the, go, ends up being excreted. And again, if we have time, I mean, we'll definitely go over this on Tuesday as well. Um, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop right there. I think I, I've given you guys enough to, uh, Keep you busy for, oops, keep you busy for a while. Um, and, oh, thank you. Someone put a note, my PowerPoint's off screen. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right. So a couple recommendations before we go is, uh, number one, um, take a look at that video that I showed you on Canvas. Um, it's Again, it doesn't go through a lot of detail, but it's a really nice summary of the blood vessels and all the processes, very well done. Um, what else? Um, <clears throat> next time, we'll finish up the urinary system, talk a bit more about sodium reabsorption, talk a bit about secretion, pH regulation, and get into micturition, which is the process of urination, how our bladder works. Um, and by next Tuesday, also well, well before that, I will send you a study guide for the next exam, which will be on May 7th. So um, any questions at this point? Looks like pretty much everyone's muted. 
for questions? All right, so if you decide you have a question, definitely um, let me know, um, email or whatever. And like we mentioned earlier, you guys ha have all, you should be able to have access to Power Lab too, or not Power Lab, that was another physiology lab, PhysioX. So, all right, see you next week. Have a great day.